Hello, and welcome to this morning's author reading and discussion with Camilla Gibb. I'm Rick Sickinger, Programming Chair for the Alice Monroe Festival of the Short Story. When I'm not doing this, my day job is the role of Tourism Development Officer for the County of Huron, promoting Huron County as a great place to visit. We really appreciate your participation in today's event. The Alice Monroe Festival of the Short Story celebrates short stories and Canadian writers in the landscape that inspired Alice Monroe. The annual festival, now in its 19th year, builds the profile of Canadian authors and storytelling. You can find out more about the festival by following us on Facebook or checking us out on our website, alicemonroefestival.ca. I would like to start today's event by acknowledging that here in County, the land where we are coming from today is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. We recognize the first people's continued stewardship of the land and water, and that this, and that this territory was subject to the dish with one spoon wampum, under which multiple nations agreed to care for the land and resources by the Great Lakes of Peace. We would also like to acknowledge and recognize the Upper Canada Treaties signed in regards to this land, which include Treaty Number 29, and Treaty 49 and a half and our roles as treaty people committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation, gratitude and respect with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. I would now like to turn it over to the, to the moderator for this morning's event, Judy Kitely. Judy is a local resident of Bayfield and has written many plays, short stories and the Rose Blair murder mystery series for the past five years. Judy and her husband have planted a vineyard and are currently planning their winery. Enjoy the event. Hi, um, I'm here today to introduce to you the author Camilla Gibb and her book that I'm going to be talking about um, is called The Relatives. Here it is. I feel both honored and humbled to be introducing internationally acclaimed author and storyteller, Camilla Gibb. Camilla is the recipient of the Trillium Book Award, the Toronto Bank Award, the CBC Canadian Literary Award, and has been shortlisted for the Giller and RBC Taylor Prize. Last year, one of her novels, Sweetness in My Belly, was adapted and made into a movie. Camilla has a PhD in anthropology from Oxford University and has been a writer in residence at the University of Toronto, the University of Alberta and the University of British Columbia. Camilla's latest book, The Relatives, can be read as a straight novel or as a book of short stories. In this novel, she very cleverly weaves the lives of four main characters into one common thread. What does it mean to be a family in this modern world? All these characters struggle with different life-altering changes, and by the end of the book, they will find themselves interconnected in ways they can, cannot ever have imagined. The Relatives is a compelling read, a sen sensitively, intelligently crafted book not to be missed by anyone. I loved it. Um, Camilla, I'd like you, if you could, to read some extracts from your book before we go into the questions. Mm, thank you. I just, I want to thank you for that very warm introduction and say good morning to everybody. Thank you for spending your Saturday morning. Uh, I wish we were all together in person. Maybe next year, maybe we'll be drinking your wine by next year, Judy. Hopefully. Maybe not in the morning, but <laughs> something to look forward to. Um, I thought I would begin at the beginning. Uh, how's my sound for everybody? It's good. Thumbs up? Good. good? Okay, great. Um, so, it, as, uh, as Judy mentioned, this is, it, it, it could be read as a collection of short stories that intersect, I suppose, or perhaps three novellas that intersect. I'm going to begin with one character, Lila. Jackie presses a manila file into my hands for the third time in four months. 
The label is simply marked Robin. I know she thinks it will do me good to take the case on, but she also knows me well enough not to say it. We've been working together now for more than a decade. I interned here during my social work training, and two years later, after my first job ended in disaster, Jackie offered me an opportunity to redeem myself under her supervision. She's a mentor and a friend. I was even maid of honor at her wedding to Solomon, a second one for each of them last year. I slap the folder against my palm and smile. Jackie knows I've run out of excuses. Robin was referred to us in the spring by the Children's Aid Society, the way most children come into our services. Our team provides mental health assessment and treatment in cases where the police are involved. This case is a particular mystery. In April, the police found a girl wandering in her pajamas in High Park. A dental exam suggested she was about 11. She didn't speak then and hasn't spoken in the five months since. No one has reported her missing or come forward to claim her. I put the file into my briefcase and take a cab home at the end of the day. The prospect of leaving the evidence of someone's trauma on a bus is just too sad. As I climb the fire escape at the back of my building, a train shudders by on the elevated track 20 feet behind me. I need to move, I say to myself, as I say to myself almost every day. I'm not supposed to be almost 40, single, and living in this apartment. It was a temporary move, a way of extricating myself quickly from Michael but I've been here now for almost two years. I plant myself on the couch and pull Robin's file out of my briefcase. The first picture I come across was taken on May 16th, just her face, gray eyes looking away from the camera, chin jutting out. Her hair is an indeterminate brown halo. Her skin is so pale, it is almost translucent, like egg white. The initial medical report identifies rickets as the likely cause of the bowing of her lower legs. She's being treated for vitamin D deficiency, giardiasis, pinworm, and anemia, anemia. The rest of the report reads like an autopsy. A list of fibers found on her body, including bark, hay, and bird feathers, and a note about traces of raccoon feces in her hair. In a later photo taken this summer, Robin's hair is brushed and trimmed and pulled back in a ponytail. She's wearing a white shirt. She gazes away from the camera, same gray eyes and translucent skin, her chin softer this time, but the overall effect still haunting. I put down the file and walk to the front window to pull the curtains closed. It started to rain. Smokers huddle under the awning of the bar across the street. If they were to look up, they'd see me in outline, a black shape at a third story window, a woman without a face. There's a photo among my mother's things, one I wish she'd never kept, of the girl they adopted in 1975. The defiance in the girl's face is painful, a futile attempt to deny her vulnerability. She's only three years old. Whatever memory she had then would be lost, at least consciously, to later experiences. It would be the unconscious that would haunt her. I've seen this in other children. I've felt it in them. I recognized it in Izzy the first time I met her. Th that, was when, that was my very first year on the job. And I told myself, whatever feelings this evokes in you, this is what you signed up for. You have the tools and the training to do this. The goal was to provide Izzy and her father with support and communication skills needed to develop and maintain a relationship. Chris was new to her life. When her mother had had a near fatal overdose, rather than letting his daughter go into care, he'd stepped up. Chris had been granted custody and Lori was in long-term rehab. With Chris's consent, I had called Lori to introduce myself. When I met her, Izzy was an anxious six-year-old who would only go to sleep in Chris's truck. 
We got her to try sleeping in the apartment on weeknights, and she'd been managing to do this more nights than not, when she suddenly started refusing to get out of the truck to go to school in the mornings. I suggested Chris talk to her teacher, the principal, try and find out whether something had happened, whether she was being bullied at school. I knew that Izzy didn't have any friends and that Chris took her straight to her classroom in the mornings rather than letting her play in the schoolyard. I'd been encouraging him to talk to other parents, try and cultivate some sense of community that could lead to friendships, maybe play dates in the future, work to normalize things for his daughter socially as much as he could. But he could not get Izzy out of the truck that week. And he couldn't leave her in the truck so that he could go into the school to talk to her teacher. He'd have to take her to work with him. And after three days of this, both he and his boss were losing patience. So I offered to try. While this was technically beyond the boundaries of my job, I met them outside Izzy's school at 8.30 the following Monday morning. I opened the door of Chris's Chevy and slid into the cab beside Izzy, who was still wearing her pajamas. Had breakfast? I asked. Cheerios, she said, pointing to a mug on the dashboard. Will you be okay here with me while your dad goes in to talk to your teacher? She nodded and Chris sighed. Okay, see you in a bit, kiddo. Something happened at school? I asked as we watched Chris walk through the front door of the school. No. Why don't you want to go? Recess. You don't like recess? Is someone being mean to you? I saw her. You saw who? Her. You mean your mom? You saw your mom at recess? Outside the fence. Did she talk to you? No. How did it make you feel? I don't know, she said, starting to cry. Dad will be mad. Well, he won't be mad at you, Izzy. She'll be mad. You haven't done anything wrong, sweetheart. She isn't supposed to be here. She's supposed to be in her program, right? She's still got a few more months. Izzy had her chin to her chest. You know what I used to love? I said, indoor recess, you know, like when it's raining. Yeah, she said, lifting her head. We do crafts. What if we suggest indoor recess for the next little while? She seemed to think this was a good idea. Maybe we should get inside before the bell goes so we have a chance to talk to your teacher. But I'm in my PJs, she said. I'm sure your dad put some clothes in your backpack. I reached for her bag on the floor and placed it on her lap. She unzipped her backpack and out came jeans, a pink sweatshirt, and a soft lunchbox adorned with sparkly Ariel. She held onto my forearm with both of her hands as we walked into the school that day. After she changed in the girls' bathroom and I talked to her teacher, she turned to me and said, can you come tomorrow? I did have a moment of hesitation, but just a moment. Without words, in the case of Robin, it's going to take some creative ways of finding clues to who she is, what she's been through, where she belongs. That part doesn't worry me. What does is that Robin's photo evokes a feeling of recognition. It's as if I am the ghost looking at the ghost who lives in me. Thank you, that's where I will end. Wow. Um, so I'm going to start the ball rolling with asking you a few questions, Camilla. Um, unless you want to read some more extracts from your book, um, we could start questions now, or if you want to read some more, that's up to you. No, I think it's probably more, I don't know, I generally find it more interesting to hear what the quest, the quest, to hear what people want to know. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I've got some questions of my own, first of all, and then I notice we've already got questions rolling up in front of me here. Um, but I'm going to start off by, um, well, I've got seven questions here, but I've noticed some of them have been repeated up on the screen there. Um, one thing I did notice, that all three women in your book, Lila, Tess and Sophie, are all written in the first person. But Adam's story is written in the third person. 
Perhaps you could explain why you chose to make Adam's story different from the, the women. Sure. Well, Adam is a character who's hard to know. Um, even he finds it difficult to know who, who he is. I mean, he doesn't actually want to know who he is. He's a character who's all constantly sort of on the run. His work allows him to kind of create different identities for himself because he has to work covertly. And I think there's some comfort in that, sort of always remaining um, hidden. I think he would never want to feel the vulnerability of trying to know himself. And so there's a kind of opaqueness and I wanted to keep him at that distance. And for me, the third person added another layer of being able to not be as truly intimate with him um, as, as the reader can be with the, other, with the other characters who are written in the first person. Um, and without giving away what happens in the book, there is a connection between Adam and the, the other stories in the book but it's not a connection everyone's going to know. So that was another reason to, he will never be known to them. And so that was another reason to keep him at this sort of distance. Well, I particularly liked Adam's story. I, I found it really exciting. Um, now, the other thing there again, at the risk, I don't want to repeat anything that anybody else has been asking, but um, when I read your memoir, This Is Happy, one quote that stood out to me from Karen Blixen Fink, author of Out of Africa, where she says, I think all sorrows can be born if you put them into a story or tell a story about them. Now, do you agree with this statement? I'm sorry, I missed the first part, but I, I heard the Isaac Dennison quote, and then what, what was your last question? Um, do you agree with this statement? I, I think it's a wonderful way of sort of processing our, our sorrow, you know, making sense of putting it into a context, that idea of a story. You know, I think we often construct these kind of narratives of our lives that allow us to understand them. And um, I'm just noticing somebody's beautiful background of irises. Heather, <laughs> stunning. <laughs> um, uh, it's, you know, I guess it has a therapeutic value, um, putting those tragic elements into a story, partly because, you know, story has a narrative arc. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and hopefully it has an end. Hopefully there's some catharsis and conclusion by the end. Um, and it, it allows you also to, to take some control over it. You know, it allows you to think about where would I like to see this story and for this character who might be me, you know? So it gives you more control over the, the, the kind of the narratives of your own life, I think. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to, I've got plenty more questions, but I'm going to go over to some of these questions on the screen in front of me. And um, from Dorothy. As a writer myself, I'm always curious about the process of writing. How much do you write every day? And do you keep a schedule? Very good question, because it cha it's changed over the course of my writing life. I think, I mean, I started really quite seriously in my mid to late 20s. And at that point, I. I was afraid not to write. I was afraid that any idea I had, um, I would lose it if, if I wasn't writing. And if I wasn't writing constantly, I would lose some kind of flow. Um, but I think that was just the kind of the early panic and early exhilaration of discovery in some ways. It's okay to step away. It's okay to allow things to filter through you, to distill. Um, it's okay to step away from the text and see what the world brings, to, your experience in the world brings to the text. I used to be very much like I had to be in that world and only in that world. Um, and I also began to trust that maybe every idea that you have and put down isn't, um, isn't necessarily important <laughs> to the story that you're writing. 
Um, so I, I don't keep notebooks in the same way that I did. I kind of, I kind of encounter what I tend to do when I go back to a manuscript I'm working on is I read it from the beginning and that becomes, you know, onerous when it's hundreds of pages, but I do, I read it from the beginning to get back into the rhythm of it, to get back into the language, to get it back into the world. Um, and I, I don't do it every day now. Um, I would like to get back to a more of a regular practice, but I would say the last 10 years, and I have a daughter who's 10, <laughs> might, you know, have been more, it's forced me to be sort of in more, in, in different places, in more places, more in the world. And I haven't quite figured out the, the balance. Um, I think my fantasy life, I was reading, was it Ursula Le Guin? I was reading somebody recently who said like they spend the morning or they spend, this would be my ideal. First thing in the morning, um, how I used to do it was I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't check email. I didn't read the news. I, um, I went from that sleepishness right to the page. And I thought that's a particularly, um, there's a particular openness then when you've been kind of un, uncompromised by the world in the day. And uh, to, to sit there and for a few hours, maybe, maybe the dream would be to sit there, eat, eat a really good lunch, work till two, <laughs> then go and putter in the garden and then get the chores done. If I could do that every day, it would be dreamy. Um, but the, the, there's the realities of parenting and the, the, the realities of, um, you know, the, the, the financial realities that it's become harder and harder over the course of the past 20 years to, to, to sustain one's life as a as a strictly as a writer, it was possible for me at an earlier stage, but now I, I teach a lot more. I mentor a lot more. I do some editorial work. Um, so those, that aspect of work has to be factored in as well. And there are times when that overtakes, but you know, I can sort of, how to put this? I have this fantasy, I suppose, because of my daughter's age, that there will be a year <laughs> When, when my mornings will be more free to go back into that sort of dreamy state and dreamy encounter with the page. Um, now, I'm curious to know about your process, <laughs> Having, that, since you asked the question. I don't know if you want to, I don't know if you, you probably, everyone's probably muted. Yeah, I unmuted myself. Um, well, I, I love to, get, I'm obviously older than you are, and uh, I get up early and I enjoy writing early, and then I quit at noon. Um, but I often, as, as you say, go back to gardening or clean my house or whatever, go shopping. But um, in the late afternoon, I often look at my, what I've written in the morning and take, take another look at what I've done uh -huh. and then do you start editing at right at that point or do you just sort of let I it do I do yeah I do I I edit as I go and um I, I don't know that works for me but it might not work for everyone I edit as I go too um definitely yeah and I think that's just the, the editing as you go is I think I don't know just I, because I've had the, I've had been really fortunate to have worked with the same editor at Doubleday for, for four books and a memoir, so five books. I, I almost, um, I almost carry her with me on my, on my shoulder. She's also mm -hmm. editing <laughs> as I go, you know. And one of her most, one of the the most potent quotes I've always kept with me was. <laughs> She once said to me, it's not the reader's job to indulge you, Camilla, as the writer. And I was like, oh, my God, that was harsh. So anytime I was having, like, too much fun or getting a little too, I don't know, too in love with the prose, I could hear her saying it's not the reader's job to indulge you. <laughs> so I would, I would have to be honest about whether, you know, I thought I was too amusing or something. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, Dorothy. Um, I have a question from Anna, Anna Ruman, and she says, 
Thank you so much to both the host and Camilla. Sweetness in the Belly, the beauty of the humanity movement, and this is happy, all sit happily on my bookshelf, knowing they are loved, and when they leave their home, they will be returned. I'm curious about how you go about creating your characters. How much writing about them that your reader never sees do you do? Are there three prompts you can share with us that will help us develop the characters in our short stories? Oh, wow, lots of good questions. Um, let me start by thanking you for, for, for being such a reader. Um, our, we, we couldn't really do what we do without readers. And I mean, we probably would persist, but it, it, it gives it a whole level different level of experience to actually to be able to talk also with readers about books which or and about characters who often feel very real at least to me very real so how do I go about creating characters I think it's you know and it is my my work is always character driven first it's not plot driven I'm sure I'd make a lot more money if I could do it if I wrote plot driven um, books thrillers um, I had an agent once say to me, why can't you just start with a dead body? Um, it's just not me. <laughs> um, so I think what it, what it starts with usually is a voice. It's trying to find the voice of a character. And I knew that I had, for instance, with this book, there was a voice. Adam had a voice very quickly. Um, and Lila had a voice very quickly, but I didn't quite know. To kind of lead me through their story. I don't ever create a sort of um, a, an outline. Some books, I think, um, lend themselves well to an outline. Mine, mine don't, because it's almost as if, I always feared that if I created an outline, before I truly knew who these characters were, it, was, it would almost be like I was asking them to act. I've handed them a script and they're going to act out this thing for me. I want to see where they go based on who they become on the page. And then it becomes much more organic and sort of, it's not like I'm forcing them to act out something I've predetermined for them. And I think that a lot of the joy for me in writing comes about that way too, which is those moments when your characters go because it makes sense for them to go somewhere that you never would have anticipated they would go. Um, and even the, I've had the experience too of a character needing to go somewhere. And I was very resistant as the author because I thought, well, I don't know anything about that. You know, in this case, it was a character in a book set in Vietnam. I knew he had to go back to his village. And I thought, what do I know about 1950s um, village life in, in North Vietnam. And, but I had to do the research, you know, in service of this character whose, whose story demanded I go there. So that was you know, two months of my life, just, just getting there for that, that one chapter. Um, but that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's kind of exhilarating that you get to learn all these new things because your characters require it of you. Um, so it's voice. And in the, in the case of this novel, I or interrelated collection of novellas or short stories or ha however we would, we would characterize it, I had more stories um, that ultimately I didn't feel were strong enough to, to, to be included with these three main narratives. Uh, and why weren't they strong enough? Because the characters weren't entirely believable at some level. And it's almost a gut feeling. Um, perhaps a gut feeling that I didn't truly know them. And it's not that your characters have to be likable, but they have to be, they have to be, well, I think you have to have a, a fair amount of empathy for them. So maybe it's when you create a sort of an emotional connection to them. You worry for them. Adam's a character who's quite, as I said, unknowable, but I worry for him. I care about him. I, I worry, uh, I still worry about him. <laughs> um, so maybe it's the characters who I failed to empathize with. Their stories never became truly realized. So those, they got cut. 
And of course, in the writing of any book, this is quite a slim book, but you, you, get, you, you write your way toward knowing them and then you figure out sort of, well, what does the reader need to know in the context of this particular story or this particular moment in their life? They don't need to know everything. And there are ways of being in kind of summarizing, uh, you know, that balance between summary and scene, being very economical and providing the information or the context the reader know, needs to know in order to interpret the scene. Um, so this took me many years to write, um, probably because I, I write more slowly now because of other distractions in my life, but also I, I wanted every word to matter. And um, I cannot say how much went by the wayside, but I've had the experience, you know, with Sweetness in the Belly, I think I'm, I'm quite sure I, I about 1,500 pages or I, I, you know, went in the bin, um, or the shredder, I'm not sure which at that point, or the fire. 1,500 pages for, that book was, was one of my longer ones, I think it was 300 and something pages, but um, a lot gets, gets discarded along the way. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, Okay, well, let's move on to Susan. And Susan asks, do you find your studies of anthropology enter into your writing? Uh, thank you for that question. I think in two ways. Um, you know, I once read something that what is similar between anthropologists and novelists is that they're both outsiders. And I think that's the, that might be just a constitutional thing, but it's also the way they both require the kind of observation that you can only achieve when you stand apart in some ways. And um, they're both interested in the same subject as well, which is, you know, who are we and what do we do and how do we form communities and cultures and how do we communicate? What do we build? What do we destroy? Where do we find meaning? How do we create meaning? Um, all these sort of big questions, I think, are the subject of perhaps many inquiries into the human condition. I mean, perhaps much of the humanities as well. But it does require, like, the, I think of ethnographic research, you know, the research of kind of ob observing within a community or at the remove from a community, that comes into play in the life of a novelist too. I mean, you're constantly making observations and you're making observations, but then you're creating the links between them, you know, and um, whether that's you with your notebook um, over, I mean, I always get my students to sit on the on the subway and well now it's less write down a conversation you've overheard now it's write down everything the person is saying into their cell phone and you don't have the context you don't have you're not hearing the other side of the conversation so now you need, you need to make up the other side of the conversation and provide the context and sort of what can you glean you know in terms of who these people are um, those sorts of direct observations, I think, come into play in the same way that when I was doing ethnographic research, it was, I was constantly recording conversation. And it's obviously, it's not just about what we say, it's about what we do, and it's about the contradictions between what we say and what we do. Um, I think a lot of the material I've been attracted to comes from, partly from my experience as, as an anthropologist, because I did work um, in Ethiopia, and I did work in Egypt as well. And so there's a kind of, there has been a sort of, a, 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 well, with Sweetness in the Belly, it was, it was partially set in Ethiopia. In this case, there's, um, it's partly set in Ethiopia. It, it, there's not a real physical reality to it beyond a refugee camp. And then Adam is kidnapped um, somewhere in Somali. But all in Somalia, but all he knows of that is he's in a room. 
He knows the room, he knows the sounds outside of the room, but he doesn't know the country. So these, um, my kind of geographical and thematic interests, um, Islam always comes into my work. I, I'm not Muslim, but it's, the, it's probably the religion I have studied the most and understand the most. And I, can, I, I always, there's always some encounter with it in my work. So that's definitely from the specific type of, or the specific places I have, I have worked. Um, was there a second part to that question? I'm not sure, I'm gonna go up and see. Oh, I, you know what I, ne I neglected to answer? Was somebody had asked me about writing prompts for characters. Um, you know what, I'd prefer to, if I could send that to you. Um, yes, that was to Anna. I have a really good list that I um, share with my students. It's not really about writing prompts, it's about how to, how to get to know this character. And you answer a lot of kind of, you answer a lot of, it's like interviewing this person and then finding out what's most salient about it, about this person. But I could certainly share that with you. Oh, well, that would be great if you could. Um, so let's move on to Carol. And Carol says, Camilla, does the relatives draw from inspiration from your own experiences of motherhood? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, it's the, 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 the impetus was um, I had a... Um, I had a child by way of donor insemination, donor sperm, um, anonymous. And so it provokes all sorts of questions for me about, you know, where does a child come from? What's the relationship between nature and nurture? Um, what do we do with the unknown? I didn't, in this case, want to explore my own daughter's story because I think that's her story. But I thought if I explore it in the lives of others and I look at different ways in which we negotiate this nature, nurture, you know, you know, I looked at I, everything. I looked at sort of donor sperm, but also donor egg. Um, and in the case of one of the couples here, um, it's two women who can, they've used donor sperm and one of the woman's eggs and they have several, they create several embryo, embryos to go through IVF, but some of them remain in frozen, in storage. And um, they, they, they've separated, but one of them still wants to use the frozen embryos. So all sorts of interest, it brings up all sorts of interesting ethical and legal and emotional issues about ownership of this material and how we how we treat it in the law and how we treat it uh, in, many, in many, many ways. And I, that's, a, that's a case, I mean, there've been several cases of this where couples have split up and there's, there's two cases actually in Ontario where we're unclear. We're unclear whether we treat this as property to be disposed of in the same way that um, other marital assets are divided um, there's a long-running case with Sofia Vergara, the, the American actress, whose husband wanted access to the frozen embryos after their divorce. Um, I'm not sure what happened in that case, ultimately. Um, but all of the, all, it's, it, this is all terrain that we don't really have a lot of material in the way of legal precedent. We don't have, they're all any number of different kind of combinations and permutations that we don't have the answers to necessarily. And, um, and when I say we don't have much precedent in terms of the law, I'm not, I'm not saying that the law needs to answer these questions for us necessarily. I'm not sure that we want to invite how much we want to invite the law into our domestic lives. But um, it's really, I think, tricky terrain, and um, it's interesting to me. So I wanted to see what kind of situations uh, might arise where, 
where families are 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 composed in ways other than um, you know kind of heterosexual heteronormative. In one case, Lila is a single woman um, who I don't want to give away her story. <laughs> And then in another case, uh, a woman loves a man who donated sperm when he was quite young, but he doesn't want to have children with her. And that raises very complicated feelings. So it's just rich. Um, it began, you know, with my own, my own somewhat uncomplicated story compared to the stories in this, in this book. Um, it's just a rich... I like those, the prickly sort of terrain of it, and I like the ethical complexities of it. And, and that's what I love about your writing. You, you, you weave all these things in, and, and it's, it's, it leaves you with lots and lots of questions. Um, now, I have just two more questions for you. Um, now, Linda Turner says, your sharing is very valuable. Can you speak about ways you may have researched context, for example, in the reading you did? Have you used any sources to inform you about children who have social workers in their lives? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, yes, I do a ton of research, but the thing is to, to make sure the research isn't kind of conspicuous. And I also, I researched to the point where it's sparked by imagination because I don't want to be, I don't also want to be too attached. I don't want to be inhibited in terms of what I create by facts necessarily. I want to use them in service of my imagination. And then of course I run into places where I'm like, I need somebody to check this to see if I've got this right. So most of the research I did um, in terms of the social work and in terms of fertility law um, was by talking with former work, well, several social workers who had either worked with children's aid or had worked with, um, how to describe it, had formerly worked with children's aid, actually. So they had, they, they could show it to me from both sides. Um, and, you know, asking them very detailed questions like, well, what would happen, you know, wouldn't, Robin have to go to school and, you know, learned that she had, had, would have to go to a spe special chartered school at a certain age. When would she live in a group home rather than live, uh, be kind of fostered in a smaller, um, you know, and, and once you get those answers too, you, you modify certain details. Okay, so I want her to be 11. I don't want her to be quite old enough to go into a group home just yet. And then with the fertility um, law stuff, which is fascinating, I spoke with two fertility lawyers um, about a lot, and I did a ton of research about this. But, you know, our, there, our laws are so different. I, so much more of the material that's available is, is U.S., is American law. But that gets you into all sorts of different debates around personhood often, like when is an embryo a person, which is generally not the debate that takes place in Canada. I think it's more kind of a religiously informed debate that often enters the arena. Um, so, and so, you know, even the two fertility lawyers I spoke to said it's a bit like, um, it's a bit wild out there. And, um, and then in terms of the aid worker and, the, and his role in the State Department, again, I talked to people in the State Department. I talked to aid workers who, live, uh, who work in Ethiopia and Somalia. Um, so I think every section, there were conversations. Oh, yes, I also talked to somebody. I talked to a, a trauma psychiatrist about, um, you know, Adam. He definitely been traumatized by his experience, but he has a relationship with Sophie. And I had a really basic question. I was like, would he, uh, he's so traumatized. Would he have any interest or ability to have sex? You know, so I, you know, I need to know the details. The answer was yes. <laughs> wow. Well, without giving too much away, um, I mean, as I said before, I really liked Adam's story. 
Um, I love anything set in Africa. Um, but we don't really want to talk too much more about Adam because I think the story would be given away. Um, I have just one more question, and I'm sure it's one that you've been asked countless times. Uh, has the pandemic helped or hindered your writing? Um, definitely hindered. Um, it, it's really hard, you know, given, given how difficult and in, in some moments frightening it has been for people. And this, it, it, just the need to kind of attend to the day to day, um, which is often the same day, every day. <laughs> um, the need to attend to the day-to-day -day doesn't really lend itself to kind of losing yourself in, a, in an imaginary space um, for any extended period of time. What I have been, what I found as a kind of, I still need to create. And what I found myself doing, which was not by, it was more by accident than design, was I started making collages. And I realized that I could say things through collage before or in lieu of word, using words. I, I was overwhelmed at the beginning by, as I, I, I'm sure many of us are, and we have to, to kind of, I don't know, talk ourselves off a ledge a bit. When you start thinking about the planet, what we've done to the planet, like that just gets too huge. So how to break it down. I started making collages that often had to do with our relationship to nature or our relationship to animals. And some of them were quite, you know, whimsical or absurd. And others were, I don't know, they just, they just to me. I didn't have the words. And I also think a lot of, I think with writing, you know, there's so much reflection that goes into a book we can't really write, me write meaningfully about what is happening now until, we, until years from now. And people said the same thing after 9-11, that, you know, n n no, that in, in fact, the great 9-11 book would either be written 20 years later or, or there are, it would be oblique in reference to 9-11, you know. And... Uh, yeah, so for the time being, I've been making collages, but I can feel it coming. I can feel the, the need. When I was describing that fantasy, uh, I think it was Dorothy had asked the question about writing practice. Was it Dorothy? Yes, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I remember that, Dorothy, forgive me, but my cat is called Dorothy, so that's why it stayed with me. <laughs> <laughs> From The Wizard of Oz, because my daughter was four. Um, <laughs> So I was thinking about that, and as I was describing it, I was like, oh, God, would I love to do that? Wake up, just, you know, make a cup of tea, sit down on my computer, and just be in it for the morning. And then putter in the garden. <laughs> so it, it, it will return. <laughs> yeah. We will, we all will return to we some will. semblance of life. But I also think we've, you know, I really hope that we have taken in I, I hope that we are changed in ways, in positive ways, by this experience. Well, as usual, Camilla, you have answered with complete honesty, and, and that's what I love about your, you and your work. Um, so thank you, everyone, for participating in this amazing discussion. And, of course, a huge thank you to Camilla for writing such thought-provoking and intelligent prose. I personally am in awe of your work and greatly look forward to your next novel. I would also like to thank the following sponsors and the Alice Munro Committee that work tirelessly each year to put together this wonderful festival. And all the books from this festival can be found at the Village Books Shop and the Huron County Libraries. And the other thing is to please remember to put in your diaries the first weekend in June of 2022. So I'd like to thank the sponsors, County of Huron, Township of North Huron, Ontario Arts Council, Dr. Mar Marie Gear, Royal Homes, Capital Power, 
and Micro Age Basics, Hurontel, and there were a number of other sponsors, but thank you all so much.